Uh, as Kate said, my name is Dr. Kristen Burden. I am the Teacher Programs and Curriculum Specialist at the National World War II Museum. Uh, and today, I'm happy to introduce two of our master teachers who have come, uh, who are joining us today. Uh, we have Laura Romero Balestros uh, coming to us from Tucson, Arizona, and uh, Michael Arvidas coming to us from New Orleans, Louisiana. And these two teachers both participated in our Summer Teacher Institute, which uh, was the first iteration of teacher professional development workshops offered by the National World War II Museum. Both of these teachers were in the second group to come through the museum. And admittedly, one of the best perks of my job is getting to work with amazing teachers like Mike and Laura. So I'm, I don't want to take any time away from them. I'm going to go ahead and hand this off to both uh, of our uh, former teachers, uh, master teachers who have been trained on our curriculum. And they're going to present to you all today about teaching uh, about, about D-Day. So with that, I'll hand it over. Hi, I'm uh, Mike Arvitas. Uh, so today we're gonna be talking about D-Day. And for me, D-Day is a, a really special thing. Uh, it's really what kind of got me hooked into World War II. It's one of the quintessential turning points of the war for the United States. It's when we really take the lead, I think on the global stage uh, in World War II as well. Uh, and there's a lot of things we could talk about with D-Day. I mean, you could just talk about numbers. Numbers are insane. There's uh, over 11,000 planes used, 5,333 ships, 150,000 soldiers, over 13,000 paratroopers drop in, 50,000 vehicles. Uh, you know, the, the, we could talk about the sacrifices that were made, over 4,000 Allied soldiers killed during the, the D-Day invasions. But more importantly, I think what we're going to talk about today, at least from my perspective, is we're going to talk about the buildup and some of the decisions that had to be made for D-Day to be possible. Winston Churchill called D-Day uh, the most difficult and complex operation to ever take place. And so that's going to be one of the things that we try and reiterate. Uh, secondly, the second half of our presentation, we'll look at how you can use film to, to better depict the sacrifices our soldiers went through. Because as a teacher, it's very hard for me to kind of convey the just pure brutality of D-Day. And so we'll be looking at how to use a movie like Saving Private Ryan uh, for that as well. So we're gonna get started and kind of talk about uh, the general operation as a whole. And so this is a, a map of Operation Overlord. Uh, operation Overlord is the code name for D-Day. And I wanted to kind of talk about what actually happened before we talk about some of the, the things that had to happen first. So. To understand the complexity, you have two, two major armies, right? You have the British Army, you have the United States Army. They have to work together in tandem. That's not an easy process at all. And so the United States and the British had to get along. And that's kind of a remarkable thing in, in and of itself. In World War I, that was a big problem. The French and the British didn't always get along. The Americans and the British didn't get along. And the Americans and the French rarely got along. And so in planning D-Day, they had to come up with who was going to lead it. And that is going to eventually be Dwight D. Eisenhower. And Eisenhower as a general is very important because he is a guy who gets people to work together. And a lot of books that you read about D-Day will tell you that there's one word that really defines why D-Day worked and it's teamwork. D-Day is the, you know, it, it's also the kind of buildup. Everything that happens on D-Day is kind of a result of the last three and a half years of war. Every manufactured point, every buildup of soldiers, every landing that took place in Africa, the Pacific, in Sicily, and Italy, this all goes into this one quintessential moment. And it's very important because to dislodge the Nazis from Europe, really the allies had to invade France. And so I think it's important to understand this, the scope of that. Uh, now, when we look at this map, this map is, is, is actually from the World War II Museum, and it, and it shows you where the army groups are landing, and it shows you the beachheads and everything else. But it also shows you the paratrooper drops, and that's another aspect of D-Day that, that goes on. This isn't just an amphibious landing. Okay, D-Day is going to have multiple factors. There's, uh, there's the Air Corps, which is going to bomb the area in and around Normandy and France as a whole. There's the Navy barrage that has to take place before. There is the airborne drops that take place the night of D-Day. So on June 5th, right? The airborne are going to get up in their planes, they're going to take off, and they're going to drop in the middle of the night in the early morning hours of June 6th, and they're going to be spread across the Normandy countryside. Um, and and then, then you have the amphibious landings, and amphibious landings historically have not gone overly well to highly defended positions, and so that's something that's very important to understand. Now, now when we talk about the actual things that have to happen in D-Day, one thing we have to understand is that for this to work, it has to be a surprise, and I always find that kind of remarkable when it comes to D-Day because it has to be a complete surprise. If the Nazis know where the Americans and the British are going to land, they can build up panzer divisions, they can build up their soldiers, and it just won't work. 
okay? And, and we'll, be, we'll be dead in our tracks on the beaches. And the other part about D-Day that's really remarkable is there is no backup plan. Eisenhower talks about this in his memoirs constantly about how this was a decision. This was an all or nothing push. And he didn't know if they would ever get the resources to do this again. Definitely not in 1944. So this, if it failed, could have delayed the war for a whole other year. So that's something to kind of con uh, consider. Now, for it to work, the Allies need a couple of things to happen. They have to control the air, right? So they have to control the air. Now, over Europe from 1940, really 1942, all the way through 1944, uh, the Allies had waged a bomber war in Europe, and they had bombed the Germans constantly. In 1943, going forward, we're talking Americans bombing during the, during, uh, the day, the British bombing at night, and the German infrastructure, the German manufacturing core is going to be severely hindered by this. What that really did, though, is by bombing Germany, the German Air Force had to move. So they had to move the Luftwaffe out of France and primarily defend Germany. The other aspect was the Russians invading from the east, but that's a whole other story to make this more complex. The other part was the sea. As, as some of you might know, the Germans utilized U-boats, they utilized mining and everything else in the English Channel. And so the Allies had to control the Atlantic, in particular the English Channel. And so there's a concentrated effort all throughout 1943 to do that. And really by January and February of 1944, the Allies are in control of the sea and in control of the air. The next factor is the buildup of troops and equipment. The United States is the largest manufacturer in World War II. You know, we go from having an army of 180,000 soldiers at, at the beginning of the war to recruiting more than 7 million people in the armed services. And that's a remarkable feat. But even more remarkable are the amount of things that they were able to manufacture and create. And that manufacturing and the ability to ship them using the convoy system across the Atlantic Ocean to Britain and then put them into bases uh, to be used was, was remarkable. The museum, the National World War II Museum, in fact, is in New Orleans because the boats, the Higgins boats that were used to land on D-Day were manufactured in New Orleans. And so that is actually the reason why the museum is located there. And those boats are a, a really kind of a remarkable piece of American ingenuity. The flat bottoms and the ramps and everything else, that was all designed to do this. And so I think it's kind of you know, important to understand that all of this kind of you know, goes into it. You, you also look at the control of information. And that's actually probably my favorite part of this. The control of information is so incredibly important. Like I said before, the Germans can't know when we're going and where we're going. And so we had to control the information in this and make sure that the Germans believed that we were going to attack somewhere else. And that place is going to be the Pas de Calais. We also faked them out and they thought we might've gone to Norway too, but that's going to be the big thing. We're going to talk about that in a second. And this is a map. This is a, I like this map. This is from the National World War II Museum. So if you're a teacher, World War II classroom, uh, I highly recommend you, you register because you can use these resources for your classes. It's a phenomenal resource. This is a bomber map, right? And so this map shows you the air war in Europe, but we can use it for a couple of other reasons. And if you look on this map, right, if you look on this map, you have uh, the closest point between England and France uh, with the English Channel. It gets really, really narrow. Um, that, that point is the Pas de Calais. Okay. And the Germans believe that's where we're going to invade. And so when they make the Atlantic wall, they're going to put Erwin Rommel, who's one of the, the best German uh, generals of the war. They put him in charge of constructing this Atlantic wall, fortress Europe, right? They're going to protect the coast from the, the allied uh, invasion. They really beef up the Pas de Calais. It had twice as many mines as anywhere else. It had the largest concrete structures. It had the most soldiers. More importantly, it had the panzer divisions and a airfield within close proximity to defend it from allied invasion. And so for us to make this work, we had to make sure that the Germans thought we were actually gonna attack there. And so that's really important. Now, the other part this map shows you is that every invasion that took place prior to D-Day led to bombings, okay? And we see in Africa, we see US planes taking off to bomb Southern Germany and Austria and parts of Eastern Europe. In Southern Italy, we see those planes bombing uh, some of the manufacturing centers in Poland and in Germany. Uh, and then of course the British bombings as well. And so all of that kind of adds together. And keep in mind, this took thousands and thousands of planes. Um, the, the casualty rates in 1942 and 43 for US airmen are astronomical. It's by far the largest casualty rates that we get. The initial air raids over Berlin, we're talking like 50% of the planes going down. Uh, so this is you know, quite remarkable. Now, if we, we go to the next slide, uh, we're gonna see the idea of where, okay? And so this is a, a nice little military map. It shows you the actual landings of D-Day and everything else. But again, if you look where Calais is, that's the shortest possible place. And so the question became, how do you convince the Germans? How do you convince the Germans that this is where you're going to land? And so for the Allies, they had a couple of things that went into this. And so there, 
and let's actually start from the beginning. The first major thing that goes into this is, is an operation. I don't know if it's actually an operation, but it's called Double Cross. Double Cross takes place in Britain from 1941 through 45. And basically by the end of 1941 and 1942, the British had discovered almost every German spy in England. And what they did is instead of arresting them and hanging them or putting them in prison, they used them to double cross the Germans. So they're gonna feed them real information, but generally information that is used after the time in which it's needed. And so they give these guys, you know, kind of fake information, basically information to allow them to, you know, dupe the Germans into thinking that they have this great intelligence apparatus. And by the way, Hitler is completely fooled by this. He believes German intelligence is far superior to the British. Little did he know that the British had also captured an Enigma machine. And between the British and the Americans, they're going to decipher this thing in, in, a, in a project called Ultra. Uh, and if you want to see a neat movie on Project Ultra, the imitation game, highly recommend it. Um, project Ultra is an ultra secret deciphering program where the Americans and the British, really the British are at the, at the forefront of this, are deciphering the German code. And they can pinpoint where Germans go uh, and, where, and what they value in terms of uh, strategy. And so Ultra is so incredibly important for this as well. Now, they're gonna use these two things to feed misinformation into Europe. And that is gonna be vital to, to the success of D-Day. As I said before, if the Germans build up in Normandy, this doesn't work. So what they know are a couple of things. One, they believe the Pas de Calais is where the attack will come. So they're gonna take George Patton, who's probably one of the most famous generals in the war. Um, and, and a lot of people, I always talk to my students, they, they always say, Patton, Patton, Patton. But there's a lot of other generals. Patton is used at this point as a diversion. And so they create this fake U.S. Army group that's going to be stationed near Dover. It's going to be stationed near Dover. And this fake U.S. Army group, and the picture here is fantastic. So you look at this picture and you're like, whoa, man, these guys, these guys must be really strong, right? They're holding up this giant tank. But if you look closely, this is a balloon. This is an inflatable tank. And so they created a whole bunch of these little inflatable vehicles, and they would move them around fields, and they would selectively let German reconnaissance fly over those areas. Patton's fake army also included fake radio transmission going out just like a normal army's would. So constant radio transmission. They had fake training exercises. They took uh, basically these little things and they made fake tread marks on the grass. And so this was all kind of part of this fake out operation. And so it's, it's a pretty interesting thing when you think about this. They went into so much depth. They had another fake out operation that actually led the uh, Germans to putting, I, think, I forget how many divisions, but a number of divisions in Norway because they thought, oh, maybe they'll attack Norway and then come from the south. Um, and so this was designed to fake Hitler out. Well, it works so well, so incredibly well that Hitler uh, will not remove panzer divisions for over four days after the actual invasion on June 6th. They still thought the Pas de Calais was going to be the actual uh, attacking point. And even two weeks later, there's still German communication talking about how they're still coming at Calais. They're still coming at Calais. And the reason for that is every German attack generally had a feint, and they believed Normandy was a feint. It was a fake, and they were going to bring it to Calais. But this is exactly uh, what, what they had. Other parts of the intelligence included the fact that we basically made them think we had double the amount of people we had and double the amount of equipment we had. Um, now, to keep this secret, um, there's a couple of different scenarios, if you're a teacher, that you can use. Uh, on World War II Classroom, we have these uh, strategic decision-making scenarios, and these are really, really good. Um, the one that I have up here, I, we're not going to read it necessarily, but it's really cool to look at. Um, and so basically, you have a situation where we decipher a German message that, that lets us know that there are Germans everywhere in this little area that's about to be invaded. And so George Patton has to decide, are we going to let the airborne know that the, the Germans are there, possibly giving up ultra secret, or are we going to just kind of roll the dice and let them land like it would be? And the decision is yours to make as a student. And I'm not going to tell you the answer. So if you want to ask a question about this, this, uh, this situation, you can in the comments. Um, but that was the, the main thing. Do you protect the code or do you save soldiers' lives? And which is more important? And ultimately, what is going to save more lives, protecting the code for the whole war or losing it in the one instance? And I think that's really important. There's also another video that asks about Allied bombings in France, which is very good as well. Uh, do you bomb just bridges and railroads or do you need to bomb French cities to prevent supplies from getting to the beachhead? And that was a hard decision for people to make. Uh, now, if we move on to the, to the next section, um, weather conditions, and, and I'm going to kind of speed through this because I know time will run a little short. Uh, weather conditions really matter during D-Day. Uh, there was only a couple of weeks in the month of June that would have actually worked. And so when they selected June 1st through the 7th or so as the actual proposed time of, of the D-Day invasion. And on June 3rd, huge thunderstorm starts to hit. And so you have Dwight D. Eisenhower who's sitting there and he's hearing weather advisories. And it's like, what do I do? 
uh, do I do this huge thunderstorm or do, do, I, do, I, do I land in a thunderstorm or not? And the problem was the Air, Air Corps was like, we can't bomb when there's heavy clouds and rain. We can't have paratroopers drop with heavy cloud and rain. The Navy's like, we can't see well enough to shoot inland. And so they have to wait. Um, and it's going to get pushed back in the night of June 5th. It's a thunderstorm, okay? So it's raining um, or early morning, June 5th, late night, June 4th. But Eisenhower has to make the decision. Keep in mind, soldiers were loaded onto boats on June 3rd and June 4th. And so they've been at sea already. And so he has, he has to make this decision. His weather advisor says, look, it's not going to be raining on June 6th, I promise you. Light cloud coverage, that's all we're going to have. And so Eisenhower, in the middle of this thunderstorm, where literally he's woken up by the house he's in shaking from thunder, uh, he has to make this decision. He talks to his generals, and they each give him their thing. Montgomery's like, let's go, let's go. Uh, the weather guy's, let's go. The, the Air, Air Corps guy's like, there's clouds, we don't want to go. Eisenhower then takes a moment, thinks to himself, and he is going to decide to go on this invasion. And it is his decision, his alone, and it's a very momentous occasion. And it really produces the all or nothing gamble that is D-Day. And this, is, this picture is him kind of talking to U.S. paratroopers who he sees out. He goes to their, their airfields and he sees them out and watches the last planes take off. Because once those planes take off, it's, it, it is, it is going to happen. Okay, those paratroopers are leaving on June 5th in the late evening. And they're going to be landing in France uh, in the next few hours. And so that is the decision making that Dwight D. Eisenhower and the other generals had to make. So... I'm going to turn this over to Laura, who's going to talk to you a little bit about the invasion and, and some of the tools you can use in terms of video. Thanks, Mike. Um, so just as Mike said about getting into making connection with the museum, um, being a middle school teacher, uh, you have to find different ways that it meets not only their interests, but is age appropriate for them. So the World War II Museum provided ample information, lessons, opportunities um, to help me to grow as a teacher to be able to address World War II with my students in a way that would keep their attention, again, 13, 14 year olds, um, and then also provide all the information that I would be able to, uh, again, become extremely knowledgeable on what is happening. Um, so one of the ways that uh, to help with understanding uh, World War II, specifically D-Day, is that teachers use videos, history teachers, ample amount of videos out there to use. But the question always comes into play is, what do I have to look at when I am actually going to use a video in my classroom to enhance my curriculum? Because that's the purpose of it, is to enhance those primary sources that you're using so that your students get a better understanding, a stronger picture, of what is happening. So these um, are a few aspects that um, you must always consider when using a video. The very first thing is making sure that you have parental consent. Um, again, being a middle school teacher, uh, all of my students are under the age of 18. And usually what I do is make sure that that parent permission goes out the first week of school. And in there, I do make reference to some of the movies that I am going to be using, but I give the disclaimer of why. Why are we going to be watching those specific scenes is to enhance the curriculum. It isn't just going to be movie appreciation. So you need to make sure that you have that permission um, in record before you even get started with your actual school year. Now, going into that, you need to pick specific scenes, a whole movie. Yes, it's nice to see. However, it, the purpose of using a video is to enhance what you're teaching. So just as Mike just went over everything that he did, um, so going into those lessons, having kids take it apart, do the different scenarios, and then getting into using the video to help to get a visual understanding of what all of that planning actually looked like. So you gotta pick a specific scene or scenes that you're gonna use to enhance your curriculum. Always have a set of questions for them. They need to, as they're watching this video clip, know specifically what is their purpose? What am I supposed to get out of watching this 15 minutes, this 20 minute video clip? Um, and always what I found, found to be uh, helpful is to have the times of when you're gonna pause the video so that way students, of course, absences, um, kids being called out for whatever reason, they always have a reference point of, I stopped at this point, I need to continue watching from here. Um, it also helps you to keep track of where you're supposed to pause the video and have those interactions with your students. 
uh, pausing ample time for them to be able to process what they're seeing. You don't want to pause one minute after watching, 30 seconds after watching, and then ask a question. That's too much. In some cases, you are going to pause about 45 seconds in, um, but then later on, it, it serves that specific purpose. So you have to look specifically at that spacing for them to be able to process what is it that they're actually supposed to be identifying in the film, internalizing as they're watching it. Uh, levels of complexity. Yes, have right there questions. In this part, we're gonna, I want you to take a look at what are they doing? What are they seeing? What is happening? But you also need to make sure that you have those questions that have them think about their situation, what they already know, what they hope to know, what they hope to learn, um, what they've experienced in their own lives with maybe they may have grandparents or great grandparents who were part of the war um, or any other of our wars that we've been involved in. It helps them to make that personal connection of, yeah, my grandfather told me this, my grandmother, my dad. Um, coming from a city where we are military base, um, I do have lots of students that make that connection. Yeah, my dad is a soldier. Um, so it helps them to make that connection of what it is that they're seeing. And then in that way, they're more apt to want to participate. When you have um, a chance, try to make those connections with topics with uh, outside of what it is you're specifically watching. Is there something else that you've learned before and help them to bring that back? Always going back to what you've already taught them to bring it in connection with what you're current, currently looking at in the video. Um, also look at making questions that connect with the current climate, um, what's happening in the world, uh, what is happening 2020. Is there anything that you can make that connection with them with the video that you're seeing? So it brings the past, this movie, and the present all together um, to, again, help them with those levels of complexity. Get your students to start thinking right from the very start of the video clip that you're showing them. Um, in the example that I'm going to be showing you in a little bit, there's about 30 seconds we get into the video and then it's paused and they've got to think about what they just saw, what they would be thinking of. And it gets them right at the start to, I'm invested because now I have to think about me as a person. Um, what I try to do is have students uh, read the questions before we're going to start the next part. It gets them engaged so they know exactly where they're supposed to be. It also puts them on point. Here's the next item we're looking for. Um, and it also helps for students who need a little bit more time to process and answer the question that they previously were supposed to answer. Uh, I do encourage my students to watch the video in its entirety on their own time. And I do offer after school opportunity because I want them to see the film. To, there's more involved in it. However, time, we just don't have it. And it needs to be very specific to your curriculum. Again, remember, these videos are there to enhance your curriculum, not to take the place of. Um, so it also provides that opportunity to make that connection with them. Okay, so the video that we're going to be addressing today, as with what Mike was going over, is the D-Day landing. So now that we have all of this preparation, we know what is supposed to be happening, now we actually want to see what takes place. And um, we do have the excellent movie, Saving Private Ryan. And so here we have a couple of questions that I have created using that format, those aspects that to consider. Um, and so the video clip again is about starts at four minutes and 30 seconds to 28 minutes. And so looking at that time specifically is the D-Day landing. That's all we're going to focus on. That's the only part of the movie that I use to help to enhance my curriculum. So we'll go over a couple of these. So um, one of the questions that we uh, that I have my students um, look at answering is Right from the very start, um, in that very beginning of the film, you have the soldiers that they're on, the Higgins boat. Um, they can't see over it, but they can hear. They're on the waves crashing. Their uh, captain is yelling out orders. Um, they turn to the left, turn to the right. You see some soldiers who are praying. You have some soldiers that are vomiting. And so I asked my students right at that point where the wheel is turning for the platform to come down, pause right there, uh, 
what's going through your mind. Put yourself in the shoes of these soldiers. Your officers are yelling at you. you you're looking to the left. You're looking to the right. These guys, you know, hey, the guy in front of me, the guy behind me may not make it. Uh, you're also in the water, you're in the waves, you're a little seasick, you're nervous, all these things are going through you. What are you thinking at this point in time? Um, so this very short little start to pause, very short, but the kids really think about, wow, well, let me, let me take a minute for that. Um, if I were in that situation, these are the things that I would be looking at. Um, so that's the very first question that I start off with them. And then I go through throughout the worksheet, looking at um, pausing at different points. And I get to the question, uh, the morality question. When we get to that point of in the film where you have the German soldiers who have just um, been introduced to the flamethrower and they are jumping out of the bunker and you have the soldier who says, don't shoot them, let them burn. So we pause there and I ask my students the question, is this right? What would you do in this situation? Would you end the lives of these soldiers who obviously are in pain, they're on fire, or would you just let it happen? So this is a point where they have to really dig deep into themselves and take into consideration of what they've seen so far in the film and put themselves in the shoes of the soldiers. Um, what would I do in this situation? What's the right thing to do? Um, so we have questions like that. Um, then we have our ending questions that have to do with the current climate. So the actual bunkers, the artillery that is still located at Normandy. Uh, so those things there are available for people to go and see. So I asked my students the question, if you were the French government, is, do you agree with them keeping all of these items still there? Uh, yes, these are primary sources. These are things that uh, are part of our history that will never go away. What is the justification for keeping them there? And then the next question is, now take the perspective of a veteran and their family members. Is this something that should continue to stay there? Should they remove those items? Should they tear them down? Um, putting them in that situation of, okay, so does this help them or does it hurt them? So you have a wide range of questions that you're looking at to have the students answer um, to make those, those uh, connections with them. Um, also, we have, uh, as I said earlier, try to make connections with other topics that you've linked with the students. So one of the questions that I have is concerning that point in the landing when you have the soldier who is handed a Hitler Youth knife. And he has seen things, he has gone through things, he's made it to the rallying point, he's made it to the, uh, to the top, he's there fighting, everything is kind of getting under control by the Allied forces, and then he's handed this knife. Why at that point in time does he emotionally break down? Why? And this opens up that communication of uh, making the connection to the Holocaust. And so at this point in time, I would have already uh, covered parts of the Holocaust with my students to help them to make that connection. So when they hear the phrase, a Hitler youth knife, they already know what it is, but they see how the soldier reacts. And so they internalize that and put themselves into his shoes. Um, so that's the best thing for my students is to put themselves in the shoes of the people who were actually there, who were involved, what they experienced, and take them to that next point. Um, so those are a few things um, there. And uh, there's other questions, as you can see in the chat, um, that those have uh, uh, been made available to you, the worksheet that I use. Um, so it's about 10 questions. Now, taken to the next step, an extension activity, the World War II Museum actually did a podcast on the anniversary of the movie Saving Private Ryan, and they did an excellent podcast a couple summers back. And so you'll see here, here's the link of it. And uh, so we have, it's episode 103, celebrating its 20th anniversary. Um, and so the question that I would have you ask your students after listening to it is, do you agree or disagree with the views of the historians who are taking part in this podcast? So it gives them that other 
extension of a of another way to use a uh, secondary source to help them to understand exactly what took place on that day and looking at the historical aspects of it and making those connections with them. So um, basically that's it, Saving Private Ryan, D-Day, that specific, uh, you know, uh, 24 minutes is uh, everything that helps the students to really internalize what they see, what the soldiers went through and all of that planning that was put into place. Uh, even though there was all this planning, strategic uh, plans, everything going that was supposed to be perfect, we see uh, right from the very start, the plans just kind of fall apart and the soldiers have to, on their feet, in the water, on the sand, they've got to go the next step and they've got to figure things out. Um, if not, um, this whole endeavor will fail and we'll have thousands of men perish on the beaches. All right. Well, uh, I'll very quickly, just want to say one more time, a thank you to both Mike and Laura for your presentations today. We do have some time for a few questions and we've received a few from both Facebook and through Zoom. So uh, first question, um, if there's one takeaway uh, from D-Day that students should know, what is it? I think, oh, look, Laura, you can go first. Um, well, what I was going to think is that um, looking at all the planning and, and looking at the video and podcast and everything is for them to understand that this was that turning point. We, we were at this point where we weren't seeing everything that we thought we would see that uh, the allied forces are not making all of these uh, conquering moves. And so that at this point with that, uh, this huge in, huge invasion taking place that the kids would see this is we needed this we needed this badly in order for to continue to get the American people to continue to stay on board to continue to buy those war bonds to support our troops to support what the government was doing um, and and to end um, the tyranny that was happening in Europe to maintain freedom and making that connection that we're we're all in this together. This is that global uh, endeavor that needed to take place on this time. I think there's a couple of things you can kind of that are really important to instill in your students. One, this is the definitive operation from the U.S. standpoint. It doesn't end the war. Uh, and I think in textbooks, textbooks do a horrible job of this, uh, especially U.S. history textbooks where it's like D-Day and then the next paragraph and they took Paris. That, those are months apart. And so I think this is the beginning of allied operations in France. It's the decisive event that puts the Germans in retreat across France. I think that's really important to do. But from a, a soldier standpoint, like Laura was saying at the end of her presentation, the ability of U.S. soldiers, when plans did go arise, to rapidly think on the fly and change their tactics, change what they're doing, uh, the airborne who are all scattered to do the things that they do, uh, and then, of course, on the beaches where people aren't landing on the right landing zones and their ability to adapt and overcome. Uh, I think that's one of the biggest takeaways you get. It's sheer determination by U.S. and British soldiers that make this thing really happen. The best plans are great um, until the bullets start flying was, is, is a quote from a general. I forget, I forget who says that, but uh, that, that's really what I kind of take from it. It's that sheer determination and then that this is the decisive action that will eventually lead to the retreat of Nazi Germany across France and eventually the, the fall of the Third Reich. All right, um, thank you. Another question. Were the radio messages between the Allies public and did the Germans suspect a plan? So it's interesting, like the more you read about it, um, there are German intelligence people who do say, look, they're trying to fake us. But the problem was we were faking them. I only gave you like three sites. We were faking them on dozens of sites. And so they thought anywhere from Brittany, all the way up to Norway was up for attack. Um, and so the, when we say radio messages, these are military encrypted messages uh, that are going out and we're letting them have a piece of that. And so we are sending, sending messages that are public. It's not like a radio address, uh, I don't think. They do have public addresses that Patton gives in Dover. And those are very, very real. The other thing they do is in newspapers, British newspapers could get to Germany within about 48 hours they would get produced and they could get, the Germans could get them through Spain. And, throw, and so they would release these reports about this army buildup in Dover 
uh, and one in Scotland for the Norway invasion. And that would be leaked into Germany intentionally. And so that's to answer yes and no, <laughs> it's always overly complex, but yeah, uh, they, they are intentionally releasing things and they are publicly doing things. All right. Uh, Laura, this question is likely for you. What do you do if students do not have permission to watch the movie? Um, so this is why I do the permission slip at the very beginning of the school year. So when I get about 80% back, then that's when I start making my personal phone calls. So I reach out to the parents that I haven't gotten those permission slips back or that the parents have check marked no. So that's when I reach out to make that phone call and, and um, address their concerns and make them aware of specifically what it is I'm showing, why I'm showing that and further impressing upon them that it is related to the curriculum. It's to enhance it. And um, I tell them again, we're not watching the whole film. That's not the purpose. That doesn't serve my teaching purpose. I have specific scenes to show. Um, I do make them aware of the language. And I do say in some cases, the language, uh, although I, I don't say yes, I'm all for that language. Um, I do explain to them in some cases, the language uh, helps to impress upon what the soldiers are feeling at that time, their, their aggravation, their frustration, uh, their determination to do what they're supposed to do. So um, I have have as of yet in my 20 years of teaching, a parent after that conversation say, no, I still don't want them to watch it. So I think that personal connection really goes a long way. And doing that at the very beginning of the school year, again, you'll have those parents with you all the way through the last day of school. Uh -huh. uh, here's something for both of you. Um, what are some of the biggest misconceptions students have about D-Day or about World War II in general? <laughs> um, it's kind of that, that time of, um, because there are so many movies out there, they, they, uh, they think in their mind, again, um, teaching middle school, um, they think it was a couple months and it was all over. And it's like, no, <laughs> that's not exactly what happened. Everything wasn't perfect. You didn't have uh, these great love affairs going on and these, you know, everybody working great and everything was fabulous. It's like, no, even up at the top level, the president and MacArthur were fighting a lot, <laughs> you know, and giving them those stories that are kept out of the textbooks um, helps them to understand, oh, okay, that's not what I thought, and this is the reality of it. I, I think, uh, like Laura said, there's so much pop culture stuff out. Uh, I always mess with my students because I, I teach a World War II class uh, for seniors, and a couple of weeks in, they're like, well, you just kind of ruined my childhood on what this was, and that's because a lot of these, these students, they get their information from this from video games, uh, like, you know, Call of Duty, Battlefield. So it's the first person shooter, the one man versus the army, which that doesn't usually work very well. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, so, so I, I think they, they, they get that in there. They also, th there is a, uh, a sense, like Laura said, that it ended quickly. Um, and I think as time has passed, uh, students, because they're not exposed to it enough, have forgotten the amount of sacrifice that actually goes into it. Um, I said earlier that, you know, D-Day happens on June 6th. Paris is not taken till the fall. The Battle of Normandy is one of the most violent battles in, in the whole war. It's fought for yards, not miles. And it's in the hedgerow country. It's just chaotic. And, and it's just this grit and determination that pushes forward. And so a lot of students, I find, don't necessarily get that right. The other thing with D-Day is they don't always get, and teaching seniors, this is really important. Um, everything in World War II is old. They don't realize that these people are their age. And, you know, they're 18, 19, 20 year old kids uh, who are going out. I think the average age for U.S. soldiers is right around 23 and a half to 24. Um, and so, I mean, you have a lot of young, young men who are, who are involved in this. And I think that's really, really important uh, to get. And they also don't get the scope. Uh, they fail to kind of connect the dots. You know, World War II, D-Day happens. This is the largest amphibious invasion in human history. We have Saipan in the Pacific Ocean happening at the same time. And making the connection between like how big of an event this actually is, I think it is really hard for students to get um, and kind of and kind of get in, you know, and do that. Um, by the way, the other question about not being able to show videos, if your school or if parents don't necessarily want you showing the movie, they do have some good resources online that you can use. Uh, World War II Classroom, like I said before, has a whole bunch of stuff. They have a really good video on D-Day. It's about 15 minutes. 
Um, but I think like Laura said, if you can get that permission slip at the beginning of this, the year, it, it works really well. All right. Uh, one question asks, what role did the French, especially the French resistance play on D-Day? Uh, a big role. Um, and I actually did, I kind of glossed over, um, I didn't really mention the French, but the French resistance play a large role. Um, I always, when we went to Normandy in our teacher institute, I think when we were learning about the French resistance a little bit, because we had questions, because we had a French tour guide. And what he said was like, sometimes the French resistance is overplayed, and then at the same time, it's underplayed. And so the French resistance was important because they did leak troop movements constantly uh, to the United States. Um, and then when the landings are taking place, the French resistance does go into action. And there are some sabotage operations that take place to decrease Nazi mobility using rail lines and everything else. Um, so they are immensely important in understanding how many soldiers are in Normandy. Uh, and then of course, when the invasion starts, having them inland as operatives was really, really important. Um, so I, I mean, I think they're very important and it's an undercovered part, I think, in curriculums because obviously as school, as school goes, there's just so much you could talk about. Um, so yeah. All right, um, we have time for about one more. And for this one, it's a, a general request to uh, both of you. What books on World War II would you recommend to your students for at both the middle and high school level? Uh, well, for us, we have, um, we actually got brand new books for, for our school to use. And so we're still going through them, but we have uh, different ones that are specifically for um, D-Day to use the bomb, to not use the bomb. Um, but um, I look at different aspects and looking more at those stories that were written by soldiers who were there um, and uh, in what and and letters that were used so finding that collection of uh, drawings that they've made and letters sending home and again in the world war ii classroom you have uh, letters primary sources uh, that were written by the soldiers back home so i tend to use a lot of of those in my classroom, not uh, per se books. Um, I do use one book, um, but that's more about the Holocaust with them um, to give them that background knowledge. Um, but again, time is always an issue. Um, so I stick close to those, those shorter letters, their drawings, their poems that the soldiers make to uh, send back home to their family members and those diary entries. So uh, a book per se, I do not have. Yeah, I always find the firsthand accounts and the letters are, are, are so immensely important. Um, excerpts from Ernie Pyle, uh, he's a famous World War II reporter. He, he, they have a, he has a book that compiles all of his stories. Excerpts from that, particularly from different places in the war, like his excerpts from Anzio are just chilling. Um, I find those are really good uh, to, to clip out in a U.S. history class. I've used, um, and I actually grabbed them, so I, I used Band of Brothers um, one, a couple years. Um, that worked out okay in a, in a U.S. history class for, for juniors. Um, like I said, I teach a World War II class, which is year-round, and so in that one, I have like a really wide berth of things I could use. Um, I know in our curriculum, the, the book Night on the Holocaust, I find is, is, is used in a lot of different places. If you can coordinate with the English department to really, uh, you know, combine some some cross curricular stuff and get them to adopt the book, I think those are really good um, for upper level kids. Uh, there's a book called The Generals by uh, Winston Groom, which is really good. Um, it's about uh, MacArthur, Eisenhower, um, and, and uh, it's escaping me <laughs> the last one, but uh, it's about the three, three major generals in, in the war for the U.S. Uh, and the British, or for you for the U.S. And, and that one's really good. Um, I've also used uh, Don Miller, History of World War II is really good. Uh, Anthony Beaver's Second World War uh, is really good. Um, there's a, a War to Be Won is another one that's really good. Uh, on D-Day itself, uh, there's so many books. Um, it's, it's absolutely crazy how many books there are on D-Day. So, I mean, that, that's kind of, kind of out there. But as far as the class goes, it depends on what your level is. Uh, I think in middle school, um, it's better to use excerpts, though, if you can find a smaller book that has a lot of like soldier stories in it, I think that's really good. Um, yeah. Upper level, more specific, if it's a targeted class, you just have to kind of, you have to know your audience, I think. Um, problem with using Band of Brothers is obviously there's a miniseries, that's 10 parts. Um, 
So, I mean, it just depends on how that goes. All right. Well, uh, a big thanks to both Mike and Laura again for joining us. Good to see your faces here and always. Uh, thanks to everybody who's tuned in to join us today, to the teachers and those who are just interested participants. Uh, I hope you come back to our uh, next scheduled webinar uh, and I hope you all are having a good day. Thank you again to Mike and Laura and thank you all. Have a good day. Thank you.